Miss Lily, you want to be president of the United States? Lily is back. She's back, and look how attentive she is. Look at that look. You are so cute. Lily Cam is on. I think someone gave her a T E R E A T Y. I wasn't looking. <laughs> Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Lots of stuff going on, lots of the news, respiratory viruses everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, the Director General of the, of the WHO stated that uh, they're having a lot of trouble tracking COVID worldwide because people aren't really doing the surveillance and monitoring, monitoring that they used to. But in the countries that are doing the surveillance, it's all up. That's Italy and the United Kingdom in cases. Uh, but for, they are tracking ICU and hospitalizations. And in Europe and the USA, they're all going up uh, relative to COVID. Uh, the big concern, of course, is that r considering the amount of viruses around, there's still not a lot of people who have been vaccinated. Uh, we have effective vaccines available, and for whatever reason, people aren't really getting them. The uh, dominant variant globally is the EG5. We'll talk a little bit about that later. That is a, a variant from the XBB uh, subvariant. I'll show you that uh, in a second. And we were talking a few weeks ago about the latest one under monitoring, the BA 2.86. That one's a little scary because it has so many different mutations and over 30 spike mutations. Everyone is very concerned that like Omicron appeared with many mutations, it would spread all over. Uh, we still don't know that it, it won't, but it, it hasn't. And so it, some thought is that maybe it's not quite as infectious as everyone thought. So here in the United States, public schools are open. Uh, in the middle of what looks like a COVID surge. Uh, there are some districts already that have had to close because of COVID uh, and other respiratory illnesses. Uh, many are now uh, reestablishing uh, testing surveillance in their schools, encouraging people to wear masks. So if there have been outbreaks to try and keep people, uh, kids in school, they're now bringing back masks and things like that. Uh, one interesting point, uh, the CDC has pointed out that RSV uh, is beginning to look like a seasonal RSV again. It always starts in the southeast and then moves to the rest of the country. During the COVID years, we saw very little RSV. And then, uh, like last year, it, it, it sort of just emerged all over the United States. But this year, it is starting in the southeast, uh, which is, you know, kind of good. Now, the, the good news is we have new strategies for RSV that we never had. We have vaccines uh, and we have monoclonal antibodies, all very, very effective. What's amazing, of course, and one of our viewers pointed this out, uh, only about 70% uh, uh, of adults over the age of 50 have ever heard about it. And I've had several uh, viewers write in and say their physicians don't know about it. So uh, <laughs> we've got to do better at communicating, apparently. So there was also a, a forecast for hospitalizations uh, this year. Uh, most people are thinking we'll peak around 57,000 people per week. Last year it was 80,000. So uh, just as you heard from uh, Dr. Piedra last week when we talked about flu, uh, we're predicting kind of a moderate season, not a really, really terrible season. Of course, we never know until it happens. But we will probably have uh, as many as a million people hospitalized, which is three times more than we had pre-pandemic. So while things aren't going to be as bad as maybe last year, they're still worse than there were pre-pandemic. So let's look at COVID. This is what I mentioned before, the numbers are up, hospitalizations are up, particularly in those over 70. And this is an interesting map. Uh, if you'll recall, I used to show this for at-risk communities and where green is low risk and yellow is uh, moderate and brown severe risk. This was September 1st. If you look by September 17th, we already have a pretty significant change with more and more counties being either moderate or high risk. And, and of course, if you look at what's the percent increase from last week in terms of hospitalizations, look at all the brown in the United States. So it is clearly increasing all across the United States. And this is our vaccine map. It's pathetic. Dark blue is over 25% of the population vaccinated, and very few states have achieved that. And unfortunately, Texas ain't one of them. Now, if you look at uh, the wastewater, we've all talked about that as being the best indicator. It's now up to 61% of all wastewater sites are reporting either uh, a 100% or over 100% increase in, in uh, viral burden. And the, the red dots, 
this is just, I think, worth looking at because it's all over the United States. It's not anywhere in particular. There are red dots showing increase all over. Here in Houston, I'm kind of hopeful that we've peaked the last two weeks. It hasn't gone up. It's still 253% of what it was in July of 2020, but mostly it's sort of a plateau now. So maybe we've seen, I hope, I hope we've seen the, the peaking of, of it in Houston. Uh, so here are the variant maps. This is, what is, this is what's driving all of this. EG5 is now the dominant strain uh, or the dominant variant. It's about 24.5% of all the variants. FL1.5 is 13.7% and the XBB variants uh, account for the rest. So if you look at the related to this map I've shown many times, these are the four dominant variants down here and they all came out from XBB. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the, the vaccine target is XBB 1.5. So it's not exactly the right one, but it's close enough it'll probably be effective. The one we're talking about, BA 2.86, comes from the BA 2 lineage, completely different. So EG5 is interesting. It was first identified in China in February of 2023, came to the United States in April. It's a descendant, as I mentioned, of XBB 1.9. And the thought was it was a single mutation that really, that seemed to like likely evade immune surveillance. It has become the dominant strain worldwide, although it's not the majority strain, it's just the dominant strain. Uh, I got a viewer question uh, last week saying, well, you've been saying the great advantage of the mRNA vaccines is the ability to do them quickly and adapt to the current strain. Why aren't they doing to the, the, the current uh, strains? Well. Good question. It would be nice if it was, as I said to the XBB, that would have been the best one. They picked 1.5. It'll probably be good enough, but you're right. It would have been nicer to have that one, but it'll still be effective, I'm sure. Uh, the BA 2.86 is the one that everyone's been worried about because of the tremendous number of mutations. Uh, you know, we all were concerned, as I said, that it was more transmissible. We don't know. And the manufacturers of the vaccine, uh, both uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna, think that there's good, they have good evidence that that strain will also be covered by the vaccine. So it looks like we have a good coverage for the vaccines. Just uh, be, we had a great uh, interview with Tony Piedra last week. Uh, and speaking of flu, we're still not seeing the big peak in flu. It's early, but it's time to get your vaccine about now. Uh, you know, the peak is usually December and January, uh, just like last year. That was last year's. There we are now with uh, H1N1 being the predominant influenza A strain. This is interesting. RSV is a lot earlier peak. This is last year's peak. Zero to four-year-olds, it really peaked in uh, mid-November. So it's a late summer, early fall versus flu, which is late fall and uh, winter. Uh, and you can see we're, we're going to get to that peak fairly soon. So. If people have uh, get the RSV vaccine, now's the time to do it. Uh, interesting, that it, so I got a lot of questions about the RSV vaccine. There are two RSV vaccines, one from uh, GSK and one from Pfizer. Um, the GSK has an adjuvant in it, which stimulates the immune system. If you look at the two, the GSK data is actually, it looks like it was more protective. After two years, it was Pfizer was 48.9%. GSK was, uh, yeah, 78% after two years. So GSK looks to be more, uh, more effective, and so I'd probably get the GSK vaccine. The CDC originally recommended everybody over the 60 get it. They kind of changed to say everybody over the age of 65 should get it, and they, over the age of 60 can get it. I don't know what that means. I'd get it over the age of 60. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, I want to congratulate Christine Eng, Professor and Vice Chair of Diagnostics in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics, and uh, Dr. Rebecca Meyer Schumann, a postdoctoral uh, associate in the lab of Huda Zagbe, who were both elected to the American Society of Human Genetics uh, as directors for a three year term. So congratulations to them. I uh, also want to congratulate Dr. Jenny Christner, the Senior Dean of the School of Medicine and the School of Health Professions, who's going to receive uh, a distinct, uh, the, from the College of Life Sciences, a Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Toledo, where she went to, uh, where she got her MD. She then went, uh, went on to the University of Michigan for her residency training. One a big shout out to uh, Gabby Coates, the Senior Coordinator of Business Operations, who's been organizing the blood drive at Baylor. Every year she does a tremendous job organizing all the blood donations, so thank you, Gabby. 
And finally, we're celebrating National Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. It's observed from seven, September 15 to October 15 to recognize the contributions and influence of Hispanic Americans whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. Specifically, I want to thank the Baylor Latino Medical Student Association for organizing events. So, all in all, uh, interesting uh, start of the fall respiratory system. I, I hope you all get your shots, get, get vaccinated, and I can't wait to see you next week.